It is a little known fact that the greatest author, inventor, painter, physicist, skier and philosopher of the past century was the Czech icon Jara Zimmermann. As the importance of this master of art and science has been lost to time and records of him have not been made available worldwide, I have taken it upon myself to educate you, dear viewer, on the life and work of Jara Zimmermann. And although the following sentence might result in me being frowned upon in Zimmermannologist circles, I consider it my duty to state it. Content warning, unreality. With Zimmermann being largely forgotten and his works missing from archives, we did not learn of his existence until September 16th of 1966 when the radio show Nealkoholická vinárna u Pavouka, a show I shall translate as Spider's Non-Alcoholic Winehouse, was broadcast by Czechoslovakian radio. It was this show when we first heard Zimmerman's name and heard about one of his artistic exploits. A collection of steamrolled items displayed as statues. This first exposure did master only fueled the curiosity of the presenters, who managed, through numerous sources, to collect some of the place Zimmerman wrote, as well as to begin collecting his life story. They began presenting both the plays and the life story under the moniker of Jara Zimmerman Feder, always presenting anecdotes of Zimmerman's life story before the plays themselves. And it is this life story wonderfully covered in the 1983 biopic Jara Zimmermann, Lejici Spitsi, which I shall translate as Jara Zimmermann, Lying, Sleeping, that I will share with you. The movie itself opens with a researcher reminiscing, speaking about going through play reviews and coming across reviews of Zimmermann's plays, plays which always had an opening night, but no follow-up showings. Deciding to do further research on Zimmermann, he travels to Liptakov, the place Zimmermann was last seen shortly after the declaration of war by the Austria-Hungarian Kaiser Franz Josef against Serbia for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, also known as the start of the Great War, later known as World War I. As he arrives in town, a group of lost tourists decide to visit the Museum of Feathers, whose guide is an elderly woman that skips through the presentation on feathers so as to focus on Zimmerman's life. The movie proceeds to show recreations of Zimmerman's life interspersed with the tour group at key locations around Liptakov and its surroundings. And if the museum guide and her tape will allow me, I shall now proceed to share the life and works of Zimmermann. We do not have the exact year Zimmermann was born. What we do know is that he was born the second child of a somewhat poor family, and that he was born in Vienna to the Czech tailor Leopold Zimmermann and the Austrian actress Madeleine Zimmermann, Ne Jelinkova. We also know that we do not know his exact birth year due to the bureaucrat in charge of making birth certificates being a notorious alcoholic and chronic drunk, performing his duties while inebriated, thus placing Zimmerman's birth anywhere between 1853 to 1884. We also know that his parents had close to a 60-year age gap as his father was 80 and his mother in her 20s. The Zimmerman line itself was long-lived, usually reaching an age of 150. The most notable part of Zimmerman's family situation, economic class as well as adolescence, was his upbringing. To save money on buying clothes, his parents decided he would be given hand-me-downs from his older sister, Luisa Zimmermann, and to allow for this, he would be raised as a girl. 
from what we know, Yara did not only not show any signs of gender dysphoria from this, as one well-versed in today's understanding of gender would expect, Yara also expressed concern about his lack of development in the ways his peers did. <sighs> you see, the Zimmerman family moved to Prague during Yara's teenage years, where he was enrolled in the Minerva Girls Preparatory Academy. As such, Yara was exposed to the way an estrogen-influenced puberty develops secondary sexual characteristics. And due to the prudishness of the era, Yara did not learn about the variations in human physiology one learns today. <sighs> so when an accident involving the gym teacher, in which she fell off a boat into a lake and hacked soaked clothes, resulted in Yara witnessing the naked body of a grown woman, well, Yara came to only one conclusion. If I'm a girl with what I have, and the gym teacher doesn't have that, then she must be a man. Unfortunately, sharing this theory with school staff quickly led to expulsion, as Yara was informed of that era's binary understanding of sex and gender. And the records following this event only ever gender Zimmerman as a man. Which is why I find it so fascinating that Zimmerman quite literally buried himself in all his creative endeavors, influencing many great artists and scientists of the late 19th century. One notable instance was during his stay in Paris, where he helped Eiffel find an apartment to rent. The movie shows a few more ways to influence his peers. For example, when he accidentally tore down Guglielmo Marconi's telegraph lines, he suggested he try it without the lines, influencing the creation of the first form of wireless telecommunication. In fact, telecommunication was a thing Zimmerman was deeply involved in, as when Alexander Graham Bell plugged in his telephone, he found he had three missed calls from Yara Zimmerman. Sadly, though, Bell was still faster in getting the telephone patent than Zimmerman, as they missed each other by mere minutes. And this would begin a career-long inability to patent anything of note. Dynamite, everything Edison ever came up with, cinematography, why anything invented in the late 19th and early 20th century was most likely invented by Zimmerman first, it was just too slow to get it patented and get credit for it. And if he didn't invent it directly, he was involved in influencing the inventor into creating it. We can at least confirm he is responsible for inventing the two-piece swimsuit. But circling back to telecommunication, Zimmerman used it to create a prototype of search engines. Using a circus tent full of accredited but bored experts, he had each of them with a dedicated phone line, and people could call in to ask any burning questions they might have had. One of the experts, a Weber, had a horrid stutter, so he always introduced himself as Weber bringing forth the WWW format. And our expert had an odd trait of using lab mice for his comparisons, providing us with the first example of mice as a peripheral use in computing. Following the movie structure, we see one of Zimmerman's artistic endeavors, which includes his collaborator asking if there ever will be a Mrs. Zimmerman. To which Zimmerman replies that if he had a family, his list of to-dos would not include inventions in writing and art, but groceries. So his collaborator asks him what his next plan is. Split the atom, Zimmerman says. No, hold on, that's later. First to split the monarchy. 
this part of the movie and this part of Zimmerman's life is really meandering and definitely not one of my favorite parts. His intention is to educate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand's children into destroying the monarchy once they grow up. And while Zimmerman's interaction with the young dukes and duchesses is endearing, it unfortunately did not result in the split of Austria-Hungary or the renaming into Austria-Hungary-Bohemia. After being ousted from the Archduke's favor following an assassination attempt on the Kaiser, Zimmermann becomes a traveling playwright. A traveling playwright, as every play ends with a dissatisfied audience and calls for refunds, forcing the troupe to hit the bricks! This era of Zimmermann's life is the one that is preserved the best, as the art Zimmermann Theater puts on these failed plays. And in fact, if you speak Czech, you can find a number of them on YouTube, uploaded thanks to their public broadcast nature. Amazingly enough, a fairy tale play included schematics for a mechanism to transition an actor from male to female during the play itself. A mechanism that the producers were <sighs> unable to reproduce in the current day. Shame, could have been useful. Zimmerman's final recorded years were spent in Liptakov, teaching at the school where his older sister used to teach before she passed away. During the years, he used his homemade camera to take a photograph of the Millers in town, and then the announcement came. Mim Narodum. To my nations. Kaiser Franz Josef declaring war for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Now, when first hearing of the assassination, Zimmermann declared that the Archduke's double was assassinated, having met him while tutoring the Archduke's children. But as history shows, such was not the case. Zimmermann disappears from history completely at this point. But the researcher in the biopic has an odd suspicion. Observing the elderly woman do her nightly ritual, knowing what he knows, he comes to a startling realization. The old woman is Yara Zimmerman, lying, sleeping in bed, having transitioned between the years 1914 and 1983. Because of that, one might even argue that Zimmermann was involved in Magnus Hirschfeld's Institut für Sexuelle Wissenschaft in Berlin. As the Nazi party burned all the research of the institute during their raid on it, and only kept the patient records to identify who to hunt, we cannot know if Zimmermann had been a patient, or a research subject, or a researcher herself. Hell, Zimmermann might have been the inventor of the vaginoplasty performed at the Institute, as she had surgical experience. Ladies, gentlemen, beings of high power, the point this presentation has been building up to ever since I noticed the parallels. Yara Zimmermann is the prototype for Bridget from Guilty Gear. And Simmerman was made up by a bunch of comedians and actors and became a national inside joke. The inside joke being that we all pretend he was a real historical figure. Hence the unreality content warning in the opening of this video. <sighs> and I'm the only one advocating that Simmerman is a physiologically born male, a side female, transitioned male, or arguably detransitioned male, and then retransitioned to female, FTMTF trans woman. Another way to phrase it is that Zimmerman was a cis girl, cis man, trans woman, in that order, as far as internal sense of gender and self goes. But then there's the whole diving into work as much as possible during the cis man years to bury those feelings of gender, 
the fact that being a girl felt right and that she wasn't allowed to be one anymore after the incident with the gym teacher and full frontal nudity. And that the free headspace of disappearing when World War I began was used up to come to the conclusion to transition and be a woman, like she was always meant to be. Now, why did I state that Simmerman is a prototype for the character of Bridget from Guilty Gear? Well, let's look at the similarities. Both were born physiologically male, with their parents deciding to raise them as girls. For one, it was due to poverty and the ability to hand down clothes and thus save money on a wardrobe. For the other, it was due to a village superstition that same-sex twins bring misfortune and that one of them has to be killed. The difference comes in their teenage years, where Zimmerman was clueless of her situation, but Bridget was made well aware of hers, so that she could keep the front up for the sake of her parents. After all, it's harder to do that when you have a twin staring you in the face. And after those teenage years comes diving into work. With Simmerman, it's literally anything and everything creative, anything to keep her mind off of her feelings. With Bridget, it's proving her town wrong by becoming a bounty hunter and bringing back a fortune proving that same-sex twins are not bringers of misfortune. But then comes the end of work. Zimmerman disappearing from history in 1914. Bridget bringing home said fortune. The weight of their work is lifted, and they don't know what to do now. So they explore their inner selves, and with encouragement by peers, they discover the womanhood they've always had, and they were always meant to have, and they reclaim it, becoming the women they are. But this understanding of both characters might be disputed by the self-proclaimed fans of them, as is evident with all the cis dudes and femboys in denial over Bridget being a trans girl, such a thing could be possible where I to approach the creators of Zimmerman to ask this and suggest it. Which is a shame, because having a character where the joke isn't this genius grew up as a girl despite not being one, but this genius is a trans woman with a fascinating life story, would be amazing. I do not suddenly have access to the creators of Yara Zimmerman to ask or propose such a reading or to introduce the lost letters between Zimmerman and Hirschfeld as the opening presentation for a play, but can you imagine if I did? And thus, I leave you all with this. Checks that gun travel with an entire person before the internet was even in its infancy, you fucking amateurs! As I said, fucking amateurs. But then again, you did create way more with Goncharov in the two months it has existed than we did with Simmerman in the... Uh, 1966, that's four years now. Six years to reach 72. 56 years, in the 56 years since we invented Simmerman. So, congratulations on all that. Now, you know what this part of the video is. It's the Patreon thanks section. So, I think I'll get that out of the way right away so that I can have them on to the side of me. 20 bucks, Aurora, 10 bucks, Kelly the Healer Witch, and Phoenix Master Giovanni, 5 bucks. If you'd like to join them, the link is in the description below to support me on Patreon. You can also buy my books on HIO, give me a one-time donation on coffee, and I especially need it right now. As it's the end of the year, I still don't have a job. They won't even hire this Griffey for retail. They won't even hire this Griffin for retail. 
I made a whole meme about that on Twitter. That's a that's a begging thing. I also made it in my pin tweet on a pin post on Tumblr, which is not a way, place where you should follow me, considering well. And if you're wondering where I am for the end section, this is the sublimity world on Chill Out VR. And yes, it's based on the infinite pools. And yes, you can walk through a huge selection of those infinite pools lovingly recreated in Chill Out VR. So come explore it and come join me in Chill Out next time I make a video. I think, Katie, this has been something. This has been me ranting for the past hour long, and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.